our next speaker um, has been developing rich web content uh, for most of his career. And he is now one of the co-founders of Eckert.io. Can I give a warm applause for John Linquist? Thanks for having me. So first, I just want to say how awesome Evan is. Uh, I remember three years ago when I met him for the first time at a small conference in Utah. And he was the one view talk um, in a two-day conference. And I, he might have been like last on the last day of the conference or something. And now to see that there's full conferences dedicated to, to view is just incredible. Um, I remember having dinner with him that night and he was coming up with all these ideas of how to live on an open source income and where to get the money from and all these ideas. And the fact that he's now doing it is just an inspiration to me. And I think for a lot of us out there, uh, he's really a model of success. And, and I just want to thank him for, for all of his hard work, his dedication and sacrifice and view for, for all of us in the community. It's, it's really spectacular. Thank you, Evan. Um, So I put together, I put my slides up on proxy.johnlinquist.com. I was assuming, because I have a lot of code, that some of the fonts might be too small. Um, I don't think that's going to be an issue given the size of the screen. So don't worry about opening that. I think we'll be fine. But first, I just want you to relax. I just forget all the best practices you know. Forget everything about uh, semicolons and for loops and Anything you ever learned, just, just let it go for a second, all right? And just come with me on a journey through metaprogramming. Now, programming is where code processes user input. So you type on your keyboard, you click on a mouse, you talk to your computer, the computer code processes that and does something with it. Metaprogramming is where the code processes itself. So a familiar example of that is object keys. The object looks, or object keys looks at the object, processes it, and finds the keys on it. That's code processing itself. Now, this presentation is about proxies. My name is John Lindquist. You can find me on Twitter and everywhere at, at John Lindquist. And proxies are a type of metaprogramming. It is code that processes itself. So why should you care? And you should care because proxies open up a whole new world of possibilities in JavaScript. So a quick logger example, kind of the first hello world of proxies everyone shows, is you get your object, and then you create a function, or it, uh, behind the scenes is creating a proxy. This function returns a proxy. And then you set a property on that object. And the magic is that this, this simple example here, could log out to the console that the first change from John to Mindy. Even though there's no console log or anything anywhere, and all you're doing is setting a property or setting a key to a value on person. So the way you do this is with a set trap. Now a set trap is a method where you'll make that assignment, and that method traps what's happening. It says, I know you're trying to set that target or that key on that target to that value. So inside of that set trap, you can do whatever you would like. And that's where the cool stuff begins to happen. And I'm not saying that it's a best practice, but it's cool. Now, a, a proper trap does use reflection. Uh, reflection is another type of metaprogramming. Uh, you can think of reflect.set is the exact same thing as target key equals value. Uh, reflect.set is just takes value key or target key value and then returns whether or not that successfully set that property. 
uh, because it's important if you're in strict mode, if an object was frozen or sealed or whatever, that if you failed to set it, you know that it failed to set. So that will return true or false, and that's important to know. Use, when using proxies, use reflection for setting and getting. Uh, the APIs just matches, the signature of the trap matches with the signature of all the reflection APIs. So we'll check the success of that. And then those traps, like that set trap, belongs to a handler object. So the handler is just simply an object with a set trap. And the target in the set trap is that person. The key is that first uh, property. And the value is John. So those go in there. And then you just do the thing. Whatever you're going to do, you do it inside of there. So those proxies, now the proxy, the only thing you need to worry about is the target and the handler. There's no, there's no really other API. I'm, I'm not going to cover the revocable stuff. Um, there's, no, there's no real API around proxies. You just pass in a target and a handler. The target was that initial object, the simple one with just a first on it, and the handler was that has a set trap on it. So from there, when you have your trap set up, I'm going to trap all those assignments being made. This function that, uh, that takes my object, so this logger function took an object and returns a proxy. That proxy has that object I passed in, the person object. It has a handler. And that handler has the set trap. And then inside that set trap is where I do the logging logic. So I can say console log and log out anything. The, the way I set up the, the template string there is just to say the key is changing from target to key to the new value and then do the actual setting of the value. All right, so sure, login is useful, but what else can I do? Uh, callbacks in Reactive, you could pass in any sort of function into that set trap, and it'll invoke that function when, when you try and make that assignment. So if you create an object, and I'm using the term observable pretty lightly here, but I say observable person and effect, and now this returns a proxy, and my person is now a proxy and I try and set a name on that proxy, that can trigger a callback. Just setting a name can trigger a callback, as crazy as that sounds. And then inside of there, you could do anything you want. You could render, request, whatever, um, because it's a callback, and you, you do what you want to do in a callback. So the implementation there is just a function that returns a proxy. Again, it's a handler with a set trap. You get that target key and value, and then you'll check whether that succeeded or failed. And then if it, if it worked, you can call a callback. It's, it's fairly straightforward there. Just check if it, if it worked. If it did, pass the target back to the callback. At this point, because you used reflection set, the target has already changed. And then that's, that's pretty much it. All of that for a little uh, reactive, every time you set a property, call a callback. Now I want to cover some bad ideas, because every, everything I do in the next few slides is going to be about fairly naive, happy path implementations of bigger ideas. But if you want to install it, you can go to NPM and say, NPM install, John Lindquist has bad ideas, um, and, and play around with, with some of these. And I'm not going to maintain this. Uh, I, have, I didn't set any bots or anything to manage my GitHub issues on this. Uh, just feel free to take it and claim it as your own if you take one of these ideas and make it something nice. So track and review. If you import the track function and the review function from this wonderful uh, NPM package, you can track the person, which returns a proxy. And then you make some changes. I'll say person first is Mindy, person last is Smith, person age is 36, so it changed from John and Lindquist and 37 to those values. And then I can use review, the review function, to say, you know what, I want to review the person and show me a list of all the changes that happened. So it'll have snapshots. So that initial object and then the following three changes, where I could review one previous snapshot, I could go back to and check on how it's changed over time. So a track implementation would be something like, you know what, I'm just going to create a weak map, you know, some place to store some histories. And then my track function is going to return a proxy, just like all the other ones did. The proxy wraps the object, it has that set trap in the handler, and then I'm going to set it. If it worked, I'm going to store it in the history. So just like a callback, just like anything else we've done, just do something if, it, if the setting works. And then you have a nice little history stored inside of a map. So then in my review function, 
I can get the history back from the map. And then based on what you passed in, I can return the entire history or a snapshot uh, based on what you pass in to this review function. So uh, you can also, there's a, a box function in there which will return a proxy. So you, I call this lock it in a box. Uh, a lot of the functional programming paradigms is about putting your objects inside of functions that allow you to map over things and whatnot. So invoking box with the person will return a proxy. And anytime you try and set a value on that, it will throw an error. So if I try and change first to something else using assignment, it will throw an error saying, nope, I'm in a box. So instead, all properties on the object are now getters and setters. So now first you have to invoke it to get the value out, or you can pass in a value and it'll change that value and return person uh, as, as a new object. And setters can also accept functions. So you could pass in some sort of upper casing function or any sort of function to map over and modify the object and then return a new object. So this would uppercase it, you'd pass it into first and return a new object uh, with the name uppercased. So the set trap for this one is simply setting and if you try and set, you throw an error. Just ignore the target and the key and the value, just throw the error, uh, don't even try it. I'm in a box. The get trap, on the other hand, instead of just returning, it would usually return the just reflect.get. So the signature is just target key, and you just get the value back. So it takes the target, takes the key, but instead we're going to return a function because we're doing getters and setters now. So the, the function takes that value, and by default, it's just going to return target key. Reflect get is the same as just doing you know target and then the brackets and key. Uh, but now we're going to check the value you pass, you pass into that function. If it's a function, then we're going to go ahead and return a proxy, because that's what this talk is about. And if the value is a function, we'll use that value as a function and uh, invoke it with the value from target, the target key. So reflect it, target key. Uh, if the value just exists, we'll return a new proxy, this time just setting the value, reflect set. Otherwise, it'll just do that default of returning the target and key. All right, so since setters return the proxy, we can do, we can chain together properties. So we can do first and then last and then age. And I think that's ridiculous, but it, it was fun to show on a slide. And it actually works. That's the crazy thing about it. Now, speaking of chain, this gave me another idea. How about we lodash all the things? So we can import chain from my wonderful library that's terrible. And you invoke chain on the person and it gives you back a proxy. Now every property on the object has all of the lodash methods, just, just kind of magically. So now we have person first, we can replace, repeat, value, and then the result would be jan, jan, jan. Uh, again, totally terrible idea. So pointless, probably. But the full chain implementation, the, the huge change right here is just import lodash, and then when you get that target and key, just return lodash.chain and pass in that target key. And then you get all those, that's all you had to do for lodashing all of your properties on an object. All right, so reactive lodash is an RxJS like the lodash of reactive. How about some RxJS, why not? So we can Rxify is the function of this terrible idea. So RxifyIn this person will give you back, give you back a proxy. And now, now we can log out the name of this person every second because name returns an observable. And now we can pipe in whatever we want. We can pipe in these operators. We pipe in a switch map, which returns an interval observable, which pipes to map to, and you know, do all this sort of, this is not an uh, RxJS talk. Um, and you can subscribe to all the changes. And if I switch it over to Mindy, now Mindy will be pushed through every second instead of the, the starting value of John. Uh, the, and if you just want to go full crazy town on this, you can create an observable from the first name, observable from the last name, you can combine them into another observable, you can pipe them through other operators, you can subscribe to that, and then the API for pushing new values in would be, you know, dot first equals Mindy, dot last equals Smith, and then those would log out John Lindquist, Mindy Lindquist, Mindy Smith as, as those values get pushed in. 
The API for this is a bit, uh, bit more to, than I can show on a slide, but it's basically the same as the setting and then invoking a, you know, behavior.next in RxJS land. So async properties were pretty easy. How about dynamic async properties? So now we can use this API idea where I can create an API, and when I invoke create API, it's going to return a proxy. API is now a proxy. And now I can get like a slash people from my API. And the way I would do this is by calling api.people. Now I didn't set up any sort of method or define it anywhere, uh, but I could also pass in you know, people one and that would return slash people slash one. Now the implementation for create API is simply the target and key we return an async function this time from just a, a regular old property. And from there, we just parse out the, the URL we want to request from the key and the ID that, you know, the key from the get trap and the ID from that function. And then we can just go ahead and fetch that URL, await for it, and then if we get that response, if response was okay, we can return the JSON. If not, you can return an error. And then you have uh, this API where you can uh, parse out these URLs and do dynamic API.people, API.starships, API.planets, whatever sort of API you want to do. Um, you can parse out the names of the properties on those objects and then pass in additional ones into the functions, which again is kind of crazy. So now that I've covered some really terrible and uh, awful ideas, I'd, I'd love to cover some good ideas to uh, kind of inspire you what's possible. So, Lenses is kind of a whole other topic, uh, a whole other talk. It would take a long time to kind of go into all the uses of lenses. But you've probably seen it in, in your own code, excuse me, in your own code base where you have to use strings to kind of generate a path to something. And that's what lenses essentially do is they generate a path to uh, some property deeply nested inside of your project. So in Ramda, you do it with uh, lens path, pass an array, images, avatar, big, the strings are gross, though, so ew, yuck, gross, nobody likes strings. Instead, you could build a lens proxy. And right now, I'm just defining the lens proxy as an underscore. And instead of strings, we have no strings here, just properties on that underscore. And that will define that path where we can recursively get and recursively return proxies based on those gets, and those get traps. And the basic idea here is that you would import your lens, you would define it, I'd say, you know what, my lens to this provider, my email provider is .contact .email .provider. And then the function will focus on an object so that um, that provider will wrap around that person and give you back and inspect it and look into contact .email .provider and give you back that value. And the result of that is Gmail, because that's what that value is, uh, deeply nested inside of the person. Now, the, the lens implementation here, which is, uh, I think, really kind of cool, is that in the get trap, again, you return a proxy of a function this time. So instead of returning the object itself, we're returning a function. You can see the, the arrow in there. And every time we call get, we're going to gather the keys. We create an initial array of keys, and then we just push keys into there. Again, this is kind of a naive implementation. Um, and then once you finally call that function that's returned from get, we'll reduce all the keys that we got. So we got contact and email provider. Uh, we'll pass in that object, and then we will reflect each time as we, as we loop through there reducing and get that final value that we're inspecting into it. Now, there's a much better implementation of this, and lenses are a much more kind of complex, uh, it's not too complex. It, it, a lens is a getter and setter that's pointing at a, a deeply nested property, usually deeply nested property. Um, and then the signature is usually a function, then a lens, then an object, or a function, then a transformer, then an object. Um, so the signature is a bit different, but the concept is, is roughly the same as what I just showed, is that it, this library, if, if you install focused, um, That'll have an implementation similar to what you just saw, and you can use that uh, on your projects to inspect 
and change properties that are deeply nested inside of your objects. Now, the, the magical one that, that I really love, it's, uh, I think it's such a wonderful way of thinking outside the box in JavaScript, and it solves a lot of problems very elegantly, is Immer. And uh, Michelle's here. I just, I just met him for the first time a few seconds ago. Um, and I, I love it because it feels like a return to the JavaScript basics, uh, because you can do the, the mutations you've always wanted to do, um, but you, f you feel like you've kind of enforced some of, the, some of these functional paradigms. So you can do this, this idea where you're blending the mutable and the immutable worlds, where produce is the function that Immer returns. Produce returns a function, so instead of returning a, uh, a proxy, it returns a function. But produce takes a function which has a draft, and this draft is the proxy. So this draft is kind of tucked away inside of Immer, and it's not exposed to the outside world. It's locked inside of this Immer scope. And on that draft, you can mutate and do whatever you want to it through the traditional array push, through any sort of assignment, through any sort of mutation that you want to do. And it'll use that proxy to generate the new object that'll come out of it. So you don't have to do the array concatenation or array spreads. It's just that simple array push. And now we have a function right here that'll push the number three onto any array you pass into it. So the result of push three, if I pass in numbers, is, is now one, two, and three. So the, the beautiful thing about this that I absolutely love is there's no more, no more concerns with deep cloning and merging because Immer can handle all of this for you, which is, this is usually a very difficult situation even, or especially when things get cyclical, there's references in the object to itself. But because of the way that Immer works, you can have a fairly deeply nested uh, property inside of your object, like this provider, but the draft doesn't care how deeply nested it is. You can just di dig into it, drill into it as deep as you want, assign it to something, and then you're done. You don't, have to, you don't return anything from the function. You don't do anything to it. Like the, the setting and getting handles all of that for you. Uh, and once you make that change, it'll return a new object that's updated with just that one single change, and it'll keep all, uh, all the rest of the things that were unchanged. It, it's, it's pretty mind-blowing if you've run into uh, these sorts of problems before. And it's so easy to update something so deeply nested in there. Um, and then also complex reducers. If you've uh, been in any of the Redux-like scenarios of where you're writing these huge reducers and the reducing logic gets really complex or you're writing child reducers inside of your main reducers, uh, let me show you that the state here in this reducer is a draft. And then when you're switching on the action, you can just say, you know what, state push to do instead of uh, spreading out the previous state of to do's and then adding it to do, it's just state push to do. If you want to update it, that's no problem. It's just state get the index dot done is true. I mean, it, it doesn't get simpler than that. That's as basic JavaScript as you can possibly write. Uh, and delete is just a splice, uh, just splice the indexes or in indices and that will remove the item from the array. And because Immer is just functions, they return functions, uh, they even compose together, so you can use a lot of the functional paradigms as far as composition. So if I, have, if I declare these two functions, one that changes the first name to Mindy and one that adds an exclamation point to the, to the first name, then I can compose them together and use them as a function where I pass in, uh, pass in some data. And you can, you can still work with uh, Ramda and other libraries inside of here and compose them together with other uh, functional programming paradigms. And Vue 3 reactivity will be built upon this. Uh, I, I made the mistake of assuming that Evan was going to talk about this more. Uh, I, I thought his talk before me was going to talk, uh, talk about some of these reactivity things. Uh, but the, in case he didn't, uh, the, the proxies are going to be a core part of the next uh, next version of Vue and Vue 3. Uh, it's all under the hood. The API doesn't change at all, so don't worry about API changes. Don't worry about any of that. Uh, but proxies are a new feature that will allow, because you're just setting properties, and proxies can kind of handle the rest under the hood, and it's a native thing in JavaScript. Um, they can get rid of a lot of code that used to do that. Uh, they can make it faster. And optimizations, because it's part of JavaScript, will always come and it'll uh, always be getting faster. 
and it'll get smaller because they were able to eliminate a lot of the, a lot of the code around it. Um, and again, even the, the reactive concepts we, we showed at the very beginning where it's just setting a property with a callback inside of it, that's, uh, the concepts there are the same as far as what, uh, what sort of ideas U3 or any, any library that's gonna use the set and then do some sort of other effect or change inside of your library. Uh, those, if, if, you, if you follow that, you'll, you'll be able to know kind of the, the concept of what's going on there. So the, my summary for my talk is just essentially do whatever you want. Make sure you have some good playtime. Um, proxies are an excellent way to play around with ideas. Uh, I, I truly believe that play is a very essential part of productivity and a happy lifestyle, and that some of your best ideas, some of your worst ideas, but also some of your best ideas will come from the time you spend playing with this stuff. So grab a proxy and start playing. And also a wise man once said that within every bad idea is a good idea waiting to be born. That was, that was me just right now. Um, so just, just make the, all those bad ideas. Um, the demos, so working demos of everything that I showed are up at proxydemos.johnlinquist.com. Uh, there's code sandboxes with links to all of those you can play with and, and fiddle, fiddle around with. Um, and then thank you for your time. It's wonderful being here. Yes. Test. Ah, nice. It works. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, are these tutorials, do you have tutorials already on ACAD? Uh, there's a few proxy tutorials. I'm not sure how in depth they go, but a lot of this content will kind of turn into future tutorials for sure. All right. So. Great. Can you share it on, uh, Git, on uh, Twitter? Share. Front end load? Share what? This, this talk? The slides? Um, yeah, or the site. Or oh, sure. Yeah. Perfect. Sure. Thank All you right. very much. Yeah.